Here they come. I've traveled the world, experiencing great warrior cultures. I've seen Vikings, barbarians, wow. even samurai. But I've never experienced a warrior culture like this. My name is Terry Shepard. I'm a Green Beret sent on combat and training missions around the world. I'm part of a long line of elite warriors tested in battle. And the only way to reveal their weapons and tactics is to experience them myself. I'm gonna search for the heart of the Zulu warrior. I'm in modern day Africa, but I could be here a couple hundred years ago about to participate with these Zulu warriors. This is an amazing thing. I've seen warrior cultures throughout the world, but I've never seen how one actually begins. The Zulus are the creation of one man, Shaka Zulu. He will grow this warrior culture from 400 men into 40,000. I want to see how this one man transformed tribes of herdsmen into one of the greatest fighting forces ever. How did Shaka Zulu create an entirely new warrior culture? First, Shaka started with the basics. How to fight. This is Zulu stick fighting, a modern day sport that grew out of the training tactics of the Zulu warrior. Shaka used stick fighting as a test of bravery. It was the first step to building his warrior force. Oh! It's fast. You can hit your opponent anywhere, anytime. And the goal is very simple. Beat your opponent until he backs down, or better yet, until he bleeds. <laughs> this is the very serious game. It's very, very dangerous. If maybe they hit you, if maybe challenge someone, you might get hit at maybe on your face. So make sure that then what I'm going to teach you. Defend is, myself. Yes, you yes. defend for yourself. Fighters often break bones or shatter teeth. But this is an effective way to gauge someone's speed, agility, and instincts. Ah, got me good. That's perfect. And uh, you guys do a lot of distracting yes, stuff too yes. when you come in. Uh, yeah. This is actually a lot lighter than you would think, and it's very fast, and it's, it comes a lot from the wrist, not, yeah. not heavy like that, it's really quick. The most common targets for a strike are the lower leg and the head. The leg because it's easy to break, and the head because the blood vessels there are close to the skin, so they bleed the easiest. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's like you've done this before, huh? No. <laughs> well, if I do anything well, it's because I have a good teacher, <laughs> and if I do anything badly, it's because I kind of suck. <laughs> but check this out. I've only been doing this for a few minutes, and you can see on my hands, I've already got some blisters that have been torn open. And what that shows is that I'm not used to fighting with this thing. Even when I grip it, as it's coming around, I can feel it pulling the skin. So these guys have really tough hands. And again, it shows the specificity of the fighting style. To get good at something, you've got to do it. And when you do it, the muscles, the skin, the tendons, all develop to make that tougher. And I better get toughened up quick, because I'm about to face my first official stick fight. The way this works is, a warrior steps into the ring and calls out who he wants to fight. Fighting. I could feel the guys around me booing me up, get me ready for combat. This is an African martial art. It's great to be a part of it. Shaka will use these fighting skills as a first step to building an empire. Today, that empire is known as Zululand, and it lies on the east coast of modern day South Africa, between the Drakensberg Mountains and the Indian Ocean. It is a landscape of lush grasslands, cut by rivers and streams into deep valleys and gorges, and is populated by some of the world's most exotic animals. Much of Zululand is still as it was during Shaka's time, 
and he would use this landscape to help develop the Zulu warrior culture. I'm now in the heart of Zululand, and Eric has invited me to Samunye Lodge, and it's a place where their traditions, their rituals, and their customs are kept alive today. The word Zulu means the heavens, and the tribe's full name, Ama Zulu, literally means the people of the heavens. The Zulu passed down their history and traditions through song and dance, like this traditional Zulu welcoming song. Today, there are almost 9 million ethnic Zulus living in South Africa, and their culture is celebrated throughout the world. But 200 years ago, most of the Zulu culture didn't even exist. 1800, the Zulus are dominated by two powerful tribes, the Mathifwa in the south and the Induandwe in the north. Between these warring tribes are the Zulus, only 2,000 strong. They have almost no influence in the region. For many of the Zulu, life was a constant struggle just to defend their grazing lands. But a new Zulu warrior is going to change all that. Shaka is born around 1786, but he is the illegitimate son of the current Zulu chief and is immediately banished by the tribe. Raised by the larger warring Mathithwa tribe, Shaka joins their army at age 17. He quickly earns a reputation as the region's most ferocious warrior and a master of even the most basic hunting weapons. <laughs> now, the Zulu were a hunting culture, and like any hunting culture, they had weapons that they used to develop the warrior skills. So, Richard, what, am I, what do we got here? What are we throwing? Uh, this is called uh, Isakila in Zulu. Isakila. Yeah, originally it's for hunting. Young Zulus would start throwing the Isakila almost as soon as they could walk. And as a training exercise, a pumpkin was used to simulate moving game. Oh, that's a lot harder to do than, than it looks. I whipped it, but I wasn't even close. The Isakila was used to hunt smaller animals, like antelope and impala. That's not so easy to do. And this pumpkin's starting to piss me off now. A skilled hunter like Shaka could crush the animal's skull from up to 30 yards away. Man, that's actually so much fun. It's like being a little kid again, throwing sticks at your buddies. And you know what? That's what develops your hunting skills. Your hunting skills develop your fighting skills, because you're used to acquiring a target, zooming in on it, and taking it out. For warfare, tribes like the Zulus developed the Isakila into another weapon. Oh, nice. The Awisa. Also known as a knob carry, the Oisa is carved from a single piece of hardwood and weighs up to five pounds. Reaching about three feet in length, it's tapered at one end for gripping, but it's the other end that's deadly. It's tipped with a simple round knob designed for one purpose, crushing bones and skulls. Now, I can tell you right now, just picking this up compared to the throwing one that we did that was kind of light and whippy, this has got some real heft. It feels a little bit like a golf club and that the weight is at the end. The difference is though, golf clubs aren't this heavy and so in another respect, it feels quite a bit like a Louisville slugger. That's a great weapon to baseball uh, bat and this is even a little bit better because the weight's concentrated very much on the end. Swinging this weapon, I can see why Shaka developed stick fighting as a training sport. The movements and tactics I learned in stick fighting are very similar to what I'm using now with the Oisa. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, right away. Notice what he did. He's whipping it around, and that would have been, that would have broken my ribs right there. So he came over the top, kept moving, and as it opened up, boom, struck me just like that. And that's what you got to remember to do. It's not one single stroke. You're already planning the next attack as you come over, and then you're going to hit this guy. That was great, man. I didn't even, you know, it was, it was cool. It was a cool move. Come. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and that's a broken rib. As a young warrior, Shaka mastered these basic weapons, but he considers this fighting style too tame. 
By nature, Shaka is more aggressive and more fearless. He wants to create a brand new warrior culture that fits this style. And he'll need new fighters, new weapons, and new tactics. 1816, Shaka's father, the chief of the Zulu, dies. Shaka invades Zulu territory with 400 troops and kills the legitimate successor. Shaka crowns himself Zulu king. Shaka, once an outcast from Zulu society, is now its leader. He's only 29 years old and he's about to redefine what it means to be a Zulu warrior. And he's gonna do this with new weapons and an unbelievably vicious fighting style. South Africa. 200 years ago, one man, Shaka Zulu, created one of the most celebrated warrior cultures in history, a warrior culture that still survives today. That thing really took off when Shaka took power. This was their main battlefield weapon, the throwing spear. That flew and landed and stuck in an elephant's skull, which is right above the target. But when they hit somebody, they're generally not gonna do, it's not gonna be lethal. They're gonna hurt them or distract them, and it reflects their warfare. Warfare before Shaka took power was really about ceremony and one-upping the guy. It wasn't about slaughter. But Shaka was about to change all that. Shaka believed only cowards fought with the throwing spear. So he invented a new weapon, and this one weapon would forever change the Zulu fighting style and their warrior mindset. All right, so Richard, now this Zulu weapon has a very specific name, doesn't it? This spear is called Ikhwa, as it was introduced by King Shaka. Why we should call it Ikhwa? He said, you know, when you're fighting, you must uh, listen to the noise, because when you push it in, it goes Ikhwa in, when you put it, it comes Ikhwa out. So think about that, the Ikhwa. This is the sound that this weapon makes when it disembowels or kills your enemy. The Ikwa was the centerpiece of Shaka's new warrior culture. Shaka created this weapon by completely redesigning the traditional throwing spear. He shortened the shaft to only three feet long. He also made the blade wider and longer, up to a foot and a half in length. By changing the weapon his warriors used, Shaka created a new fighting style. The Zulus would now fight close in, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just holding this, the kind of vibe I get from, from it is that this is a very short-range weapon. So right away, I'm thinking in my mind, aggression. The most common attack with the Ikwa was a low thrust to the groin and then an upward cut to slice open the belly, basically eviscerating the enemy in about two seconds. So, so the thing you want to do is really, if you force the guy's shield, you, exactly. now you can push him out of the way and hopefully you could come up. It yeah. goes up into the lungs. You know, what I see going on here too, Richard, is even today in fighting and martial arts, we attack from the waist down because it's a low line attack and it's very hard to stop. And so when Richard hit me with the shield, look, I, now I've lost vision. I have no idea where his spear is and he moves me out of the way and look where it is. Coming up right underneath his shield, right into my belly, right into my diaphragm. And so low line attacks, practical fighting are very, very dangerous. <laughs> and it has a grip at the back. When it is stuck, you pull it with a grip. All right, because yeah. if you go into somebody and there's yeah. blood and guts, it's gonna be very slippery and exactly. you can hit a bone and get stuck. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, this way, yeah, if you look yeah, right yeah, here, yeah, yeah. this has got a handle on it. So if you get stuck, you can come back and, and pull it and your hand would catch here. Exactly. That's genius. Yeah. genius. Yeah. So what's amazing to me is that this innovation, this short stabbing spear, the e Qua, enabled Shaka to literally create a new kind of fighting style, but also a brand new warrior culture, one that was trained, disciplined, and absolutely aggressive on the battlefield. By changing the weapon, Shaka created a more aggressive individual fighter. Now he had to create a more cohesive fighting force. Here's how he did it. This is a traditional amakanda, or barracks, where Shaka would bring young warriors and train them to live, work, and fight together as a unified Zulu army. Shaka organized his regiments by age. Up to 1,500 warriors would live and train together at each amakanda. Huts served as living quarters and encircled an open space, which was used as a training ground. And this is really no different than today. It may look different, but the principles are the same. When you live, eat, sleep, 
and trained together constantly, you develop a cohesive unit. Shaka knew this and took great advantage of it. <laughs> The Zulus, remember, have a great oral tradition, and Shaka used this tradition to help further unify his troops. This is the small shield dance, and don't think this is only a dance. This is training for warriors. This is how Shaka was able to take guys from different areas, different provinces, group them together by age, and work them. The dance is a bonding exercise, but also teaches the warriors how to work together in battle. Watch. The first line of warriors crouches down. This signifies their death in battle. Then the second line jumps over them to continue the fight. Now, you've done these. You're, yes. you're a part of this. I'm a part of what this. What does it feel like when you're doing that, man? There's that feeling, something like a goosebump running all over my body. I'm not even in it, and I feel goosebumps. So I can imagine, yes. if you were in this, what this would feel like. This is not the end of the dance. And they show that victory, that they beat you now. It's finishing up, it's finishing and they're all together, too, yes. all linked they're up. They're celebrating everything now. This is the end of the dance. <laughs> yes. You've seen how they're ever smiling. Yeah, everyone's happy now. It's ba victory and victory yes. battle, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that's real. And so I can imagine being a part of this and this being who you are. This isn't a reenactment. This is who these guys are. These guys are Zulu warriors. Shaka's new warrior culture starts to work, and it works fast. When he first takes control of the Zulu tribe, he's only got about 400 warriors. In two short years, the ranks grow to 4,000. That's impressive. Shaka wants more, and so he begins an aggressive military campaign, one that he calls the crushing. Shaka begins conquering neighboring clans to the north, but now the region's most powerful tribe, the Ndwandwe, take notice. They invade Zulu territory with one intention, annihilate Shaka's new warrior culture. The Ndwandwe are the most powerful tribe in the region. But these Zulus are no longer an insignificant clan. Under Shaka, they have become a true warrior society. And they are about to unleash a fight like nothing the world has ever seen. The Zulus. In just a few years, one man, Shaka Zulu, grew this warrior force from 400 to 40,000. This is the Zulu war dance, and this is how they psych themselves up for the battle to come. But I'm finding out that this is much more than a simple war dance. So, uh, all right, so Barry, what, 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 is this, what is this man talking about? Right okay, so he's the first guy, he's a senior prince. He's, he's singing the praises of, 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 of this particular chief, or Mkosi, right. and then going back by generation, 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 it's an oral history and it's kept perfectly intact. So when you stand up and you do your war dance, the rest of the guys all shout that behind you, and you jump, wow. and they shout your praises about what you've done in your life, and your family, and your and your family lineage, and everything, and it's just, I've done it, because I used to do this stuff, and you just feel as if your heart wants to explode, you feel so yeah. strong, because it's like a massive force behind your shoulders just driving you forward. Ah, and they're all comes. shouting his praises. And they're all, they're all talking about him right now. That's what they're doing. So he's feeling that massive power I was talking about. They shout, they all are shouting their own individual Yeah, that's memories. just propelling him. They're propelling him forward. I'm about to find out just how important the Zulu ancestors are to their warrior culture. These men are tribal shamans, and they are giving me strength bands, which have been treated with a special potion. So all the kings from the past who've ever been with us, We'll now I'll combine and we'll go with you wherever you're going. Right. Tell them, as, tell them as someone who, who is who's fighting his whole life. This 
Yeah. I can't think of anything more important. Amanda! Amanda! I'm kind of overwhelmed, man. I, I didn't expect that. Um, two very important, powerful shamans just put these bands on me. And uh, what Barry told me this means is that all of their ancestors, all of the strength that they come is now uh, with me. And um, that's a great gift, actually. This is why I went into the army. I joined the special forces because I want to be part of something bigger than me. A team, a group like this that can do anything. I'm honored that they let me in here. And as part of the group, I'm expected to participate. So the Zulus went into battle protected by their shaman, with their brothers at their side and their ancestors at their backs. There was one last element that Shaka would use to build his new warrior culture, the natural environment. If you get an idea of any kind of culture, and in our case, warrior culture, you gotta go where they live, man. You gotta go where they live and see what kind of terrain they lived on. Shaka often tested the courage of his warriors by challenging them to go into the hills of Zululand and hunt down wild game, usually without a weapon. Oh, there he is, man. But there was one animal that even the Zulus considered too dangerous. That is a big rhino just looking at us. Oh, and there's the horn. Man, he's big. Look at him looking at us. Uh-oh, they're getting up. This is 2,000 pounds of white rhino, and it can charge you at 30 miles per hour. All right, now, I'm going to get out, which is probably a crazy idea, because he's kind of looking at me, and he's closer. Hopefully he doesn't look at me as a threat. In Shaka's time, the Zulus used the hide and bones of the rhino as medicine to cure everything from coughs to snake bites. Unbelievable to see something like this. This is where they live. This is this is where they their lives are and oh here she comes. I think they're getting a little nervous with us being here. And we should probably leave. So Shaka used wild animals to test his warrior strength and bravery, but he also used wildlife as inspiration for a new battlefield formation. He called it the chest and horns because it looked like a charging bull. Shaka placed younger, quicker warriors on the left and right flanks of the formation, the horns. The most seasoned veteran fighters formed the center unit, the chest. In action, the horns would encircle the enemy, pinning them down, while the chest charged forward in the main attack. Shaka was also a brilliant battlefield general, and one of his favorite strategies was large surprise attacks. Now, he would use this landscape to conceal some or all of his forces. And so his enemy, while looking around, would think that they're safe. Think again. Thousands of Zulu warriors took part in these large-scale surprise attacks. God. And the Zulus were so fast that in later decades, British commanders told their men to consider each Zulu warrior as if they were cavalry, because they ran like horses. That was freaking scary. April 1818, all the pieces of Shaka's new warrior culture come together in one decisive battle. Using surprise attacks and hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Zulus finally defeat the much larger Ndwandwe tribe. 
power in the region suddenly and forever shifted. And with great victories comes another great Zulu tradition, one with hidden meaning. The victory dance. So here they come. Now the warriors are they're coming back to the village now after after the fight. Yeah, they're coming back from the fight. Now you can see the women and uh, the young ones that will come in yeah. their brothers and fathers back from the battle. You know what, what, a, what a source of pride. All of a sudden your son comes back from battle and he did well and he's alive and life goes on, man. This is more than just a homecoming. This is another piece of the Zulu oral tradition. Because the warriors now reenact the battle for the village. Look at the stabbing. Look at them. He's pushing their enemy away and stabbing them. Think about it. Not only is the dance a celebration of life right now, it's reenacting the fight. This is preserved for time immemorial over and over again. This happened 150 years ago. And they're doing it right now. Look at the look at the young one right there. Look at him. Ha <laughs> ha! I've been constantly impressed with the Zulus. A celebration like this not only reconnects the warrior with society, but also makes his actions legendary. As a warrior myself, I can't think of anything better than that. Man, these guys are the best. This is what I think is the best time I've had so far filming Warriors. No, it is the best time I've had filming Warriors. Bottom line. 1824. Shaka has conquered or assimilated all his neighboring tribes. Zululand now covers more than 2 million square miles. Shaka's original army of 400 is now a force of over 40,000. Shaka did it all in less than eight years. It is one of the most incredible accomplishments in military history. But for Shaka, it won't last. A personal loss is about to change everything. What happened to the man is effectively when his mother died, he'd been so closely bonded, he'd been such, through such hardship as a child when, when his father deserted him and disowned his mother. Right. And when she died, it's like something snapped inside of him. Wow. Shaka begins to rule with vicious authority and quickly alienates many of his own people. Then, just 12 years after taking control of the Zulu tribe, Shaka is violently assassinated by his own half-brothers. He was actually sitting next to a cattle fence, just like this cattle buyer right here. And um, his half-brothers came from behind. And they actually stabbed him through the fence. Through the fence. Right through the fence. And it, you know what? That's a, per that's a Shakespearean tragedy right yeah. there. And not only that, but in his, on his dying bed, he gives them a warning. Legend says that before his death, Shaka utters a chilling prophecy. He warns his killers that Zulu land will fall to white people who come from the sea. 50 years after his death, this prophecy will come true. The Zulus are about to be invaded. Ready, set! In the southern reaches of Africa, Shaka Zulu has created one of the most celebrated warrior cultures of all time, the Zulus. Ready! But 40 years after Shaka's death, the Zulus are about to face a new enemy. That is loud, man. My ears are ringing. I can smell the powder. The British are perhaps the strongest empire on Earth. Ready! And now they want Zululand. Resign! 1867. The British have limited activity in southern Africa and only a handful of outposts on the Zululand border. That's about to change. Because it has been discovered that southern Africa is rich with diamonds. The British, hungry to tap the region's diamond supply, mount a campaign to bring Zululand under their control. And they will do it with the latest in weapons technology, the Martini Henry rifle. 
The Martini Henry is a single-shot, drop-block rifle. It fires a 5.77 caliber bullet and has a kill range of 1,000 yards. When fired, the bullet leaves the muzzle traveling at 900 feet per second. Bam. Look, he opens a breach. Another one right... That's nice, man. That's smooth. Neil Aspinshaw is one of the world's best marksmen with the Martini Henry. A skilled gunman like him can get off 13 shots inside of a minute. We're getting close to the automatics. Not yet, but we're getting there. We're moving towards it. This is state-of-the-art quantum leap technology for 1879. This is the weapon of the Zulu Wars, Queen Victoria's weapon of mass destruction. To load it, simplicity in itself, you slide the round into the breech, bring the breech up, it's now cocked, ready to fire. What's really special about Neil's gun is that this isn't a replica. This is an authentic 19th century weapon. Nice. And you know what, too? It actually feels, the kick feels like a shotgun, really, is what that feels like to me. The power of this gun comes from its ammunition. So check this out. That's a pretty big slug. The ones we use today in the modern American military are 223 or 556 for NATO which is about a 22 round. This is a 45. <laughs> this is a slammer. Let's just say, for example, if we, uh, if we hit a guy coming at us with this and, and, and popped him maybe in the arm, is it gonna rip his arm off? Yeah, it's gonna rip clean away, yeah. Arm's ripped off. So there's no flesh wounds with these. Yeah, right, exactly. Absolute man stopper. Because this is a softer lead round, when it hits, the actual lead compresses and spreads out, actually, almost like a pancake. More surface area means more damage as it goes in. But I want to test out the destructive power of this gun for myself. All right, so now we've set up a target downrange. And like all shooters do, we're going to have a friendly competition to see who takes it down first. Pressure's really on now. Pressure's really, you better, you better come through, my man. <laughs> Here we go. That's a wall of 30-pound cinder blocks, and it's about 100 yards away. That was nice, man. That was a good, that was a good shot. That was a great shot. All right, here we go, man. Hey, man, <laughs> slowly but surely, we whittled it down and took down a little concrete wall. Man, I would not want to get hit by that. That is just <sighs> explosive power. Present! The British multiplied the power of the Martini Henry by firing in volleys, sometimes with over 200 men all firing at once. You can see with a well-trained, well-disciplined group of guys like this, they are literally able to send a wall of lead downrange. The Zulus would have known this, and they also would have known guys were gonna die facing this. It would have taken a lot of bravery to walk into the teeth of this enemy. Especially when you consider the Zulus went into battle wearing little or no armor. Their only piece of protective equipment, a cowhide shield. So the Zulus would go into battle with no defense against the British bullets. To protect themselves, they relied on a strong belief system, one steeped in their natural environment and rich cultural tradition. I demand the yes. yes. So now he's going to crush this bone. Crush it. And also give it to you. These Zulu shaman take the bones and skins of aggressive animals like leopards, lions, and black mambas, crush them up, and create potions that are infused with the special strengths of those animals. So in a way, so by, by, by doing that with, that with whatever, either a, yes. a, a leopard or, or, or the snake, you take on some of their characteristics and their strengths. Yes. Wow. The power of the animals is transferred to the warrior as the shaman sprinkles the potion over them with an ox tail. So not only just me, but my weapon is being yes. imbued with more power. Yes. Well, I sort of feel like I'm getting let in on a secret. I think it'd be a big mistake for you to look at something like this and go, oh, it's just some kind of hocus pocus or some primitive ritual. Big mistake. All of this stuff has real meaning, and it's just it's a real privilege to be here and kind of share it with these guys. But for me as a professional soldier, the shaman's most important role is what they do for the warrior after the battle. You have to come back straight to the traditional healer in Yanga and to get purified. They'll give you some medicine to purify it because now you've been killing a lot of people. Yeah. That 
Well, it's a it's it a heavy it's a yes. heavy burden to know that you've killed people, and yeah. then, but and 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 the priest here he purifies you for yes. every every person that that, that you yes, killed, so that you can yes. kind of reintegrate back into society and be a normal person as opposed to a killer. Yes, and then you can be a normal person. You can also move among other people. In a way, modern day, uh, we don't have that ability. We don't have that ability to have a shaman come and remove the violence from you. This kind of what people might call primitive ritual has real power, and you can't discount that. This is really vital stuff to their existence. And I think we could probably could probably use some of this. Yeah. December 1878. The British tell the Zulus they must dismantle Shaka's warrior culture or face war. The Zulus refuse. So on January 11th, 1879, the British invade. The British have already conquered most of Southern Africa, but they're about to come face to face with a fighting style they've never experienced before. And what's about to happen here will be Britain's greatest defeat at the hands of a native army. <laughs> On this battlefield, at the base of Isanwana Mountain in modern-day South Africa, the warrior culture created by Shaka Zulu would be tested against the greatest fighting force of the era, the British Army. January 1879, England wants control of Zululand. They invade. Their commander, Lord Chelmsford, leads the center offensive. 14 days into the campaign, Chelmsford and his men make camp at Isandwana. It is here that Zulu and African history will take a dramatic turn. Chelmsford never believed the Zulus would stand and fight. He thought he'd have to push them into a corner at Ulundi, their capital, which is a good 65 it's miles from here off to the east. And there he would force them to fight. Chelmsford's fought many African tribes, and all of them used hit and run guerrilla tactics. So, Chelmsford assumes the Zulu will fight this way. He's dead wrong. January 21st, Chelmsford receives word of Zulu activity to the southeast. He leaves camp, giving chase with 1,000 of his best soldiers. He believes this to be the main Zulu army. He's wrong. Because the Zulus are employing one of Shaka's classic strategies. They are using the landscape to hide their location. About 10 miles north of Chelmsford's position, here on this ridge, a small British scouting party is about to make the most terrifying discovery of their lives. As they crest this hill and look down into the valley below, they can't believe their eyes. In the valley below are camped 40,000 Zulus, including 25,000 Zulu warriors, outnumbering the British 10 to 1. It's a sight so impressive that this place is now called the Valley of the Shields. It was madness, but I don't think they anticipated finding 40,000 Zulus. 40,000 men. <sighs> Can you imagine the moment? I, that, that, that moment, their faces, and, they're, and, and they're just... Well, Zulus who survived tell us that they could hear the men inhale in the fright that they got. The Zulus now use Shaka's tactic of large-scale surprise attacks. 25,000 Zulu warriors immediately stream out of the valley and run full speed towards the British camp. They've just run five miles barefoot in under an hour, and now thousands upon thousands of Zulu warriors sprint full force at the British camp. Zulus attack in Shaka's chest and horns formation. The horns sweep out in great flanking maneuvers to encircle the camp, and then the chest, the main Zulu force, charges down a nearby ridge right at the British forces. And I want you to imagine that moment as 15,000 Zulus begin to sprint up that escarpment headed for this camp. I want you to feel the ground shake as they stamp their feet and hear those great rolling rhythmic war cries rolling out down this valley. Feet thumping into the ground, assegais stamping into their shields, headdresses billowing. The British take up formation and begin a relentless volley of gunfire. Wave after wave of Zulu are hit, and still they come, straight at the British bullets. 
power of the British rifles takes its toll. As thousands of Zulus die in a hail of lead. The British are managing to hold off the Zulu assault. The momentum of the battle is about to turn. The main assault force makes it to within 300 yards of the British line. But this gunfire is relentless. And so they take cover in this low ground called a Donga. They are facing a wall of death. And this, to me, is the critical part of the battle. At any moment, they could lose heart, turn tail and run, and the battle could be lost. But in Kosana Biala, one of their great leaders, stands up when all seems lost and says, don't run, don't run. They're hailstones. Their bullets are nothing but hailstones. And right then, he gets shot in the head and dies in front of them. But the amazing thing is, his bravery is such an inspiration that they gather their strength and their courage and they head right into the teeth of the battle. It's quite often the case that battles will hinge on a single factor. Absolutely. And this is that hinge factor That's here. It. Yep. What a key moment. Key pivotal moment to this battle. And in that moment, the Zulus would get up like a great black wave and they began to fall on the thin red line. British keep firing and firing, but even their guns are no match for the bravery and sheer numbers of the Zulu warriors. The Zulus crash into the British lines. This is what the Zulus are great at. This is the way Shaka has taught them to fight. Armed with the Iqua, the short spear that Shaka created 50 years ago, the Zulus are masters at hand-to-hand -hand combat. What follows next can only be described as a bloodbath. It's all over in less than two hours. The entire British camp is decimated, and 3,000 Zulu warriors lie dead. After this Isanwana, the battle was finished. What was the fallout of this battle? Well, there was a remarkable fallout because the Zulu king who'd never wanted this war was horrified by this opening battle. And he sued for peace, but the British had a point to make. And they were adamant that they wanted to smash this great warrior nation forever. Seven months after the Battle of Isandwana, the British ultimately defeat the Zulus and take control of Zululand. But as I've witnessed, the culture that Shaka created almost two centuries ago is stronger and more alive than ever. I came to South Africa to see how one man created a brand new warrior culture. What I now realize is that Shaka did more than that. He created a complete culture. What's interesting and, yes. and cool yes. as a soldier is that out of what we could easily look at as purely violence yes. and bloodshed comes something that's Pretty amazing and great. Chaka created the embryo of what was to become Ha Zulu culture. And it was phenomenal. It was 2,000 words short of Shakespearean English. And they had a wow. whole phenomenal oral poetry. Everything developed incredibly. Art, you literature, it. everything it, it was, 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 was really pushed forward. And that's what created the whole Zulu ethic, which to this day you can still feel the afterglow. You witnessed the afterglow. Sure. It's there. It's been one of the great pleasures of my life to be so warmly welcomed into this truly amazing warrior culture. Thank you for sharing uh, your culture with me. I've been on teams that have been all over the world in conflicts, and I want you to know that we know who you are. We know about your strength and we know about your skill, and we use it as an inspiration. My friends are going to be very, very jealous if they didn't get to meet you. Thank you. Before I leave, the local chief has one more act of generosity. He gives me an authentic Iqua to remember my visit. When you look at it, of course, you'll be thinking about the Zulu people. You yes, I will. This. See you, Bonga. Thank you, my friends. What can I really say to that, you know? Um, everybody all over the world, everybody in special forces are probably really jealous of me right now. That's a great thing. This is what warriors do. They meet each other. They train together, they share an experience, and there's often gifts involved. This is gonna go up on my wall, and uh, every time I see it, I'll think of what happened here, and I'll smile. It was a great day. For me, the Zulus prove that warriors are more than just soldiers, capable of more than just fighting. And at the core of every great culture, is the heart of a warrior.